Amen. You were singing the hymn before that, or maybe it was two before that. I was a wee bit jealous. Haven't sung that for a long time, and you all got to sing it, and I didn't. Anyway, it's very good to be here with you this evening. I want to um, just mention again my thankfulness for the invitation to come and bring God's word, and we pray that he would bless us tonight as we come around the scriptures. We'll begin worshiping the Lord in our meeting tonight with hymn 402, Jesus, what a friend of sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul, and we'll stand together to sing this, please. Let's stand, please. seated. It's a most encouraging hymn. I trust it's already encouraged you this evening. Let me invite you to bow your head with me in prayer and to seek the help of our Savior who is with us to the end. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come unto thee this evening and our hearts rejoice 
to have sung of the lover of our soul and the friend who sticks closer than a brother, who is always there, who always cares and who never will leave us alone. Thank you, O Lord, for the privilege of being saved, of knowing union with Christ, of knowing the indwelling and the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would encourage us tonight through thy word, through the hymns of praise that we sing. We thank you, Lord, for hymns, for music that enables us to lift our praise to thee and also, Lord, to be encouraged ourselves. And we pray, Lord, that even now our hearts already would have been uplifted. Lord, given a little respite. Lord, we pray for all of God's people here in the meeting tonight. We pray that you would draw alongside them. For Lord, you know their circumstances perfectly. Things that are hidden from everybody else are not hidden to thee. And concerns and burdens that are hidden to friends and Christian, uh, Christian co-workers, Lord, are not hidden to thee. And Lord, we ask that you would draw alongside this evening. And even through the scriptures, as the gospel is preached and as God's word is set forth, we pray that God's people would be encouraged. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of gathering as this congregation here in Money Slain gather week by week for the opportunity to come and to fellowship and worship with them today. We pray that you would bless each one of them. We pray that you would bless them as they seek to be faithful to Christ and to continue and to walk with God each day. Lord, give us the testimony that Enoch had that he walked with God. Lord, there is nothing better that we could do. There is no better way to spend our lives but to walk with thee. Thank you for the privilege, of Lord, of having been lifted off the broad road, having been placed uh, on the narrow way that leads to life. Lord, thank you for showing us the way to go. Thank you for directing us to Christ by whom we may enter in. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to continually lean on him. What a help he is, what a help in sorrow. While the billows around us roll, even when my heart is breaking, he, my comfort, keeps me whole. Thank you for the fact as we closed our service this morning that the child of God has stayed upon Jehovah and that in him our hearts are truly blessed. Lord, it is our desire that others would come to know this blessedness and this peace that passes all understanding, that passes the abilities of any man or woman to describe. Lord, may they come and find this peace for themselves. We pray for other congregations tonight that worship thee, give help to hear and to preach the word of God. Lord, we pray for young people tonight. We pray that young people this evening would be saved. Those who have been brought up in the gospel and as yet have not trusted Christ, who are so privileged like the village of Capernaum in Christ's own time, and yet was in danger of being cast down to hell. Lord, we pray that you would speak to such people this evening, that they would turn and that they would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of our missionaries tonight, O oh Lord. Think of those who have gone far from their homes and who faithfully serve Christ in lands that are foreign to them. We pray for those who prepare to go, that you would be with them. We pray, Lord, tonight for those who are even perceived by God's people not to be on a mission field, but Lord, in fact, that's exactly where they are. Think of those who minister in North America, very isolated, and Lord, often forgotten. We, we, we think of them as being like the churches here, and yet, Lord, they are lonely, and they are in difficult places and in hard environments with very little support around them, Lord, with which we are so blessed. The fellowship of friend with friend, just a few miles this way and a few miles that way, and we're with another free Presbyterian work. Lord, many don't have it so, and we pray that you would help us to remember them in prayer. We think of the Fosters and Penticton. We think of that work in Vancouver, Cloverdale. Bless Reverend Fitton as he has been ordained and installed there. Bless him and his wife. We pray, Lord, for that little work in Port Hope tonight. Thank you for the many years of service from Reverend Cranston. We pray that you would bless him and his wife. Thank you for his faithfulness. Lord, we admire his endurance. We pray, Lord, you would help us to be faithful. Likewise, we pray, Lord, for works that are vacant here in Northern Ireland as well. And we pray, Lord, that you would supply the need across in England, Scotland, and Wales as well. But Lord, we pray that in time to come, we would know the blessing of God, not only in supplying the needs for existing works, but Lord, even in new congregations. Lord, we think of the Irish Republic and we wonder, Lord, at the scope that there is there. And Lord, we ask that you would so bless the Free Presbyterian Church 
that in time to come, there would be new works open there and that people who need the gospel and who have not been blessed in the way that people in this province have been blessed would have gospel preaching churches opened in their areas and that sinners would come to Christ and the great work would be done for thee. Lord, bless us this evening. We pray for those who are suffering. We remember God's people and all the various difficulties that they're dealing with. We ask that you would mercifully come alongside them and minister to them. We thank you that the Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Spirit of our God, given to us, given in abundant measure. We pray that he would be poured out upon the church, not only for comfort, but for empowering and for service. Lord, continue with us this evening. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn 206, please. 206. O oh, sweet is the story of Jesus, the wonderful Savior of men, and the chorus, the wonderful, wonderful story. Let's stand to sing, please. Let me invite our brother, Mr. Sterrett, please, to come now and bring us the announcements. Thank you. Well, let me welcome you all to our gospel service this evening in the Saviour's name. We trust as we gather together that we know the Lord's presence to be with us. If you're a visitor with us, we give you special welcome. And we give a special welcome again to our visiting preacher today, Mr. Stephen Greer. We have enjoyed his ministry to our hearts already today, and we're looking forward again, Mr. Greer, to your ministry to us this evening, trusting that God will bless you and us through you as we hear the word of the Lord. Wednesday evening is our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8pm and the Reverend Henderson will be with us, God willing. And then on Thursday night is the workers' prayer meeting at 8pm. Friday night, the youth fellowship 
at 8 p.m. and the speaker will be Mr. Adam Kennedy. Services next Lord's Day, usual times. Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45 and the morning worship is 12 noon, preceded by the time of prayer at half past 11 and then the evening gospel service at 7 with the time of prayer at half past 6 and in the will of God, the Reverend Henderson will be with us again on Sunday. Today is the retiring missionary offering and we want to thank you for the maintenance fund offering last month which came to £510 and we thank you all for your generous giving towards that fund. The next session meeting is on Monday the 15th of April at 8pm. Any items for the agenda be, be would be submitted before Saturday, please. For those who have the current magazine ordered, they're to hand in the vestibule of the church as you leave there. They're just ones with the names on them. Uh, you can get your copy as you leave. We can ask you to continue to pray for the sick and for the shut-ins and for those who have been bereaved in recent days and also for those who have still and feel the loss of loved ones, continue to pray that the Lord will be their portion and blessing in these days. Thank you very much, Mr. Sterrett, for bringing the announcements and also for your kind welcome to me once again. I appreciate what you've said, and I pray the Lord will bless us all again tonight through his word. I've enjoyed my time with you today, not only fellowshipping here in the church, but also very nice hospitality, and I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful, our brother's been very thoughtful. He's asked me if I want the curtain pulled over, and I think when you live in Northern Ireland, that that would be really quite sad. <laughs> we get sunlight little enough, and so I'll just enjoy it while it's here. It's not putting me off. It's absolutely fine. It's nice to have it streaming in through the window. We're going to sing again 271, Free from the Law, O Happy Condition. Before we come to the Word of God, 271, we will keep our seats for the commencement of this hymn. Let's sing and praise the Lord, please. <clears throat> Stand for verse 3, please.
Please take your seats, and in God's Word this evening, we're turning to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read from the first verse to the end of verse 14. So let's give our attention to God's word, please. Matthew chapter 7, beginning of verse 1, and reading down to the end of verse 14. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his, own, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts. We come this evening to focus particularly on verses 13 and 14. Before we do so, let's pray and seek the help of God. Our Father in heaven, we bow our heads and we recognize that ours is a glorious calling to be called the children of God, to be called the sons of God. What manner of love is this? Oh Lord, we thank you for the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel that proclaims that whosoever will may come. And Lord, it is our desire tonight that as Christ is shown and as the gospel is proclaimed that sinners will come, and that they will stop toying with sin. Or oh Lord, stop relying on self. Lord, that they would come to Christ and leave their sins, and trust in him, and have assurance of salvation, and be on the road to heaven. Thank you for the fact that many of us are enjoying that experience right now. Lord, we long that others would join us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to pray for them, even while the gospel is preached, and that we would see answers to our prayers. Lord, we ask that you would do this for thy own glory, for thou alone art worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I've just read the last verse of a poem that's called The Road Not Taken. It's one of the best known, and apparently the best known poem in the English language, somewhat, sometimes called The Road Less Traveled because of its ending, where the author makes himself seem to be an exceptional person who took a path in life that few others were willing to take. He says that taking that road, apparently less traveled, has made all the difference. And in my study of Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, I was glad to see that I wasn't alone in thinking of Robert Frost's poem. The subject that Jesus Christ presented to his congregation here in this part of the Sermon on the Mount could well be described as the road less traveled. 
For he says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the street gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ, after having delivered much instruction to his disciples, as we read from verse 1 to verse 12, now changes tack and abruptly commands all of his listeners, enter ye in at the straight gate. What he's saying is this, to his disciples and to those who followed him merely as spectators to see what this miracle worker would do next, he says, to be my disciple truly, you must take the road less traveled where few are willing to go. I want to look at these two verses with you, and I want to show you six things about the road less traveled. The road that you must be on if you are to be saved. First of all, notice that this road is the road that only God could create. It is the road that only God could create. You see, the road less traveled is the road that only God could create because the other road is the road that leads to hell. And that is the road that we are all on when we are born into this world. Consider the broad road. It says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Verse 13, and many there be which go in thereat. This road has many people traveling on it, on the way to destruction. And therefore, we can imagine a huge multitude, a great number of people making their way down the road to destruction. And they have come onto this road through a wide gate, the text says. It's spacious. It's broad. There's ample room from one side to the other for all different kinds of people doing many different things, and yet they're all heading to the one destination. You'll notice that it's a road that people are walking on right now. It says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. This is not a matter of the past. That's present tense. Right now, there are people walking on the broad road to destruction, and there are many of them leads to destruction. The word destruction speaks of ruin. It speaks of loss and waste. It's used in the scripture to describe the state of a soul after death when they have gone into eternity without Christ. It, well, in other words, it is the state of a soul for whom there is no hope of salvation. It is not teaching us that the soul has gone out of existence. It is not teaching annihilation. It is not teaching that they have become extinct. It is that they are lost beyond all hope of salvation in hell forever. Paul spoke about people like this in Philippians 3, where verse 18 says, For many walk going down the road, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. This destruction is the total and final, final ruin of the unrepentant sinner who will eventually be cast into hell for the punishment of his sins against God's law. And I want you to understand tonight that when the Lord Jesus speaks of the sinner having gone through the wide gate and having embarked down the broad way to destruction, he speaks in a way that underlines their personal responsibility. Look at the text. It says at the end of verse 13, Many there be which go in thereat. Many there be which go in, which go in. And the words in Greek, without becoming too technical, signify that this is something that the sinner makes himself do. It's not something that he's being forced to do. It's not something in which he is entirely passive, on the other hand. He is causing himself to walk down this road. It is his personal responsibility. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned. That's willful sin. That's not accidental. It's not passive. It's the person's own choices and the person's own actions. Ecclesiastes 7.20 tells us there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And so if you're in this meeting this evening, or if you're listening online and you're not in Christ and you're still in the condition in which you were born, you are going down this road by choice, willfully sinning and on the broad road to destruction. And therefore, you can blame no one but yourself for where you are. The personal responsibility of those who are on this road. 
And therefore, this is the only road that sinners know. It's the way in which sinners are born. And if it were not for the love of God, there would be no other road. And that's why the road less traveled is the road that only God could create. How is it that there is another road? How is it that there is a narrow way to choose? Because of the love of God. Romans 5 verses 8 and 9 tells us, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, in other words, going happily down the broad road, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The very existence of the narrow way is solely and entirely due to God's sovereign grace and his infinite love for sinners in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And thus he created, he made the narrow road. And it's to Christ specifically, the one who died for sinners, that we look now, the one who is actually preaching here in Matthew 7, when we notice, secondly, that this is the road that is entered through a narrow gate. It's the road that's entered through a narrow gate. Look at what Christ says at the beginning of verse 13. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate. And then in verse 14, he says, because or for, straight is the gate. The word straight is simply a word that means narrow. It is not the opposite of crooked. Rather, it pictures objects that stand so closely together that a person, in order to pass between them, would almost have to turn sideways and go in. As a result, we use this word in the English language to describe someone who's in difficulty as it being in dire straits. Or when you take a notion to sail to Italy someday, at some point leaving the Atlantic Ocean, you would have to pass through the Straits of Gibraltar, where the land draws in very close and the body of water is very narrow. This is a narrow place. This road that leads to life is entered through a narrow gate. We're all familiar with the concept of entrance requirements. I'm speaking to many working people, and then many people who have worked. I'm speaking to people who are in school and perhaps applying for jobs or going to buy for university. You can't just walk into these things. You have to apply. You have to be assessed. You have to demonstrate a certain level of ability. You can't just walk onto a team. You have to perform some kind of trial. You can't just be given a job. You've got to apply and interview and maybe a second stage, and then you have a final stage of interview and you finally are offered the position. You see, in a much more demanding way, God has entrance requirements for heaven. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, we are told, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven, and at the beginning of this very sermon, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and verse 20, the Lord Jesus said to his listeners, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's God's entrance requirements. A righteousness that exceeds that of the most, the most scrupulous people known to his listeners. The most law-abiding, legalistic people on the face of the earth, the Pharisees and the scribes, did not possess a righteousness that was sufficient to be granted access to the kingdom of God. And therefore, there is no one in this meeting who in themselves possesses such a righteousness. Because God's entrance requirement for heaven is not only... Uh, someone who is greatly moral, someone who is well-behaved and a model citizen, it is a perfect righteousness. That's what he requires. Now, do you have that? Because I certainly don't. That's what God requires. The Lord was constantly surrounded by people who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. That's what he said about the Pharisees and the scribes before he told the, public, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. People who trust themselves that they were righteous. And it's the same today. People who take the name of Christian and play the role of a Christian, they profess to know and love God, but they have never entered through the narrow gate. They have never trusted in Christ. They certainly trust in themselves. But all the while, they're no more than sinners. They're still on the broad road. 
Their very best attempts at religion are filthy in the sight of God, fit only for destruction, leading only to their eternal loss. God's requirement is perfect righteousness. And that is a very narrow gate. There's no wriggle room. In John 10 and verse 9, Christ made it perfectly clear how and by whom we may enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 10 verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. John 14 and verse 6, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ is the narrow gate. He is the way to enter in. His righteousness is the only righteousness that God will accept because it alone is perfect. If you trust Christ alone, then you may enter in. Heaven will be yours. God will be your Father. The people of God will be your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Spirit of God will dwell within you. He will give you a new heart. He'll give you new desires. But yet, if you don't accept Christ, if you don't trust in Him, none of these things are yours. God will only accept you in Christ, but He will accept you in Christ. He will accept you forever, unquestionably, in Christ because of Christ's finished work. He will justify the person who believes in Jesus, and you may enter in. And that's why you need to notice, thirdly, that this is the road that is deliberately taken. What does Christ say at the beginning of verse 13? He says, enter ye in. That is not a suggestion. Yes, we talk about gospel invitations, but this is not an invitation. This is a command. It is the command of God to sinful men and women who need to leave all their self-righteousness or whatever else it might be that they're trusting in and to enter ye in at the straight gate, to enter in and trust in Jesus Christ. This is the road that is deliberately taken. Christ comes near the end of his sermon. He has been giving instruction. He's been telling his disciples many, many things, verses that we know well. Not doing their arms before men, not laying up treasures on earth, but rather in heaven, seeking first the kingdom of God, judging not that they be not judged. In verse 12, so famous, the golden rule, I believe it's called, therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. And many people could have been listening along and nodding their heads. Yes, that's that's good. And then they're faced with this challenge. Enter ye in. And no one can be neutral about that. No one can be passive about that. This is a command, and it's a command to all of us. This is the road that must be deliberately taken. The Lord's teaching here that no one will drift into heaven. No one will inherit eternal life without actually desiring to do so. No one will be saved by accident. But all who are saved must enter deliberately and consciously trust Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. You find this phrase, few there be that find it, and it is life, eternal life, and the gate that leads to eternal life. This word find, again, present tense, depicts a person who is looking for something, searching for something, inquiring and examining. And you'll find the same word in verse 7, which we would all know off by heart. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Same word. This finding and therefore entering into eternal life is something that should be diligently and deliberately looked for, sought for. Your flesh is against you. Your flesh desires sin. The world is against you. Your ungodly family and friends and those who would be shamed by a professing, by, by a, a true Christian who is forsaking sin, they don't want you to be saved. And so Christ commands you, enter in. And the devil, he doesn't want you to come to Christ either. He wants you to go to hell along with him. And God calls you, enter ye in. It's something that you do deliberately and consciously believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Luke chapter 13 for a parallel passage. Luke's record of the same words of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 13, where in verse 24, we find another rendering of the same thing. Luke 13, 24 says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Strive. The Greek word gives us the English word agonize. Does this give the impression 
That Christianity and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved is a half-hearted thing? No. On the contrary, this is something about which we must be absolutely explicit, entirely deliberate, trusting in Jesus Christ, fully, consciously, deliberately trusting in Him and entering in. You must not hold back. If you continue as you are now, by default, as a sinner, on the broad road to destruction, you will remain there and you will end up in hell. You must enter in. This is the road that is deliberately taken. Christ called his people here. He called sinners to enter in. Elsewhere, he called his disciples to leave all and follow him because that is the mark of a child of God. We find that word strive in Luke 13, 24, used elsewhere. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, Paul exhorts Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. It's the word fight. It's translated strive in Luke 13. It's an agonizing and intense effort. And Paul then said in Colossians 1 and verse 29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And the point that I want you to see from this is that the striving that commences in God's child at the new birth, enabling him or her to enter in and to trust in Christ by faith, is never to stop. Christian, the striving that began in you when you felt convicted of sin and were enabled by the help of the Holy Spirit To trust Christ is never to stop. It's to continue. It's to increase throughout the Christian journey. Let me emphasize something to you. As we say rightly that this road is something which must be deliberately taken, let me emphasize to you, using the words of Matthew Poole, that it is not that our labor brings us there, heaven, but that the Lord gives heaven to such as labor for it. Let me say that again. We're thinking about entering in to eventually reach eternal life. And Matthew Poole says, It is not that our labor brings us there, but that the Lord gives heaven to such as labor for it. And how does a believer labor for heaven? Fourthly, this is the road where sin must be forsaken. This is how we labor for heaven. We continually forsake sin. We repent. Imagine that narrow gate. I don't know if you've ever tried to get through a narrow gate or between a a small gap between two buildings. You can just about squeeze through yourself and there's no room to bring anything with you. And that image should get across to us that the life of the Christian is not one with scope to do as the flesh would please, like it was on the broad road, spacious and wide, accommodating of all types, All creeds, all false religions, all selfish desires, no problem. Plenty of room. That's not Christianity. We enter through a narrow gate, we trust Christ alone, we live for Him. We forsake our sin. This is the road where sin must be forsaken. Turn with me please to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. I want to read three verses from this chapter that illustrate the requirement there is on the Christian to forsake sin. Because hand in hand with faith, which is to deliberately enter in, to trust Christ consciously, is repentance to forsake our sin. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. There's a past tense walking. There's what the people who are now Christian used to do in their old walk. And so we might say these are the things that will be found and the things that will be seen in those who walk on the broad road. But should they be seen in those who are on the narrow road? No, clearly not. Christian, may the Lord challenge me and you with that phrase, in the which ye also walked sometime. Past tense. Paul is emphasizing here the same sentiment that you might have been confronted with 
When perhaps you slipped up in front of an unsaved person, you said something or you did something that was not becoming of a Christian, and they put you on the spot and said, oh, I didn't think you would have said that. The fact of the matter is that we are on a different road. We have entered in. We have trusted in Christ and we have made this profession and it is real that we are on a different road. We are not to do the things that are characteristic of those who are on the broad road. And so daily, our objective should be to forsake sin and as Paul says here in Colossians 3 and verse 5, to mortify the members which are upon the earth. And the word mortify means to kill, to put sin to death, to put the deeds of the flesh to death. In Christ, we are dead to sin and we are alive to God. We have been clothed with royal robes that we don't deserve. And therefore, let us put off the filthy garments of sin. But let us do so continually because we are on the road where sin must be forsaken. And it is a fact attested by Scripture and also by the experience of God's people throughout the ages that when we do that, when we follow Christ by faith and when we forsake sin and repent from it, then the world will oppose us. And that brings us to see that this is the road that is marked by much tribulation. Marked by much tribulation. Look back at Matthew 7 and look in verse 14 where it says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You know, Christ could never have been accused of misleading his disciples. He was never ambiguous about the difficulties that would come their way for his sake and because they were following him. He constantly reminded them about this. You can find it at the start of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, look at verse 10 and verse 11. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Here he is on a familiar theme, the theme of tribulation. One that he referred to constantly throughout his ministry. And in this text, Matthew 7 and verse 14, there's a reference to it in the description of the way to eternal life. We have this fact that it is the road marked by much tribulation. Look at the word narrow. Narrow is the way. When I was a little boy, there was a utensil lying in one of the kitchen drawers. It was a little plastic thing, and it was white. And I'm not very good at describing it, but basically it had a cone-shaped center. And the idea was that you would turn it upside down and onto the point of the cone, you would get half an orange and make yourself some orange juice. Nowadays, people would probably just use a blender. This word narrow pictures something that is being squeezed. Like you would squeeze an orange or you'd squeeze grapes to get the juice out of them. And it has a metaphorical meaning of trouble and affliction. And this is actually the appointed destiny the appointed lot would be a better word of the Christian during our lives. It's something that will touch all of us. And Christ describes the entire journey to heaven with this word narrow. We are being squeezed. We're being pressed upon on every side by many various afflictions. That's the reality of what it is to be a Christian. Not that it's the entirety of our reality, but it is part of it. Thessalonians, when they first received the word of God, Paul testifies in the first chapter of his first epistle to the Thessalonians that they received the word in much affliction. You and I were blessed, I dare say, to receive the word of God for the first time as a child in a very sheltered way with no real concerns or cares in life. Those people received the word of God for the first time in much affliction, and yet God worked in them anyway, and he saved them in spite of all the difficulty and the opposition of ungodly men. And Paul reminded the Thessalonians later that as they started, they would continue because in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, he says, speaking of tribulation, he says, yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We are appointed to this pressing, this affliction, because we are walking the narrow way. If we ever 
need a reality check of what some of God's people have had to endure for him, we could do no better than to turn to Hebrews 11. For in verse 37 of that chapter, we find a description quite graphic of what some of God's people have had to endure. It says in Hebrews eleven thirty-seven, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. I don't think any of us can imagine what that would be like. I don't know all of you in the room. I don't know all that you've gone through in your lives, but I don't think there will be very many of us who have experienced anything like that. And yet God helped those people to endure the afflictions unto which they were appointed. And the same is true for you. Going through different afflictions, no doubt, afflictions of a very different kind, mentally and emotionally, and perhaps physically as well. God has appointed you unto those things and he will see you through. Because this road that is marked by tribulation is the road that brings glorification. Finally, look at verse 13, Matthew 7 and verse 13. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate. And as we noted this morning, when a person is saved, when they are justified, that is performed once. The word enter is written in a tense that signifies that it is a complete action. It is a one-time act. It is not done over and over. When a person enters truly by faith through the narrow gate and onto the way that leads to eternal life, he or she does so once and never again. When you go through that gate, you never go back out of it. And be assured as the Bible tells us, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Be assured, as we read this morning in Romans 8, that whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. We are marching upwards to Zion, to the beautiful city of God, to the full enjoyment of all that Christ has purchased for us, the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life, not just meaning life that goes on forever, that would be no good if it were not life with Christ. People in hell have life goes on forever, but they have it in the place of torment. But we, after a lifetime of, yes, blessing and joy and peace that passes all understanding, which we need in order to sustain us through the pressing and the trials, will be brought to glory and Matthew 5 and verse 12, at the end of that first section of the Sermon on the Mount, is concluded with these words, Rejoice! After he tells them of the persecution that they will suffer, and in fact that they are blessed or happy whenever those things occur, he is telling them, concluding with the words, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so today, we recognize that it is not an easy road that it is a road marked by much tribulation, but that it is the only good road. It's the only good way to be on. Because this way and no other way brings glorification. Praise God today, Christian, if you have found the way that leads to life. Let me encourage you today to press on into the kingdom. And then to those of you who are not saved, I hope it is abundantly clear to you that the way on which you currently travel is the way that leads to destruction. Look at the words of Jesus Christ, Matthew 7, verse 13. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, to the eternal and irreversible loss of your soul. But in contrast, there is a way that leads unto life. That way has been presented before you I'm sure not just today, on many Lord's days previous. That way, that gate through which you can enter is the Lord Jesus Christ. By me, he said, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You could be saved this evening. You could be saved right now. Your future in heaven can be secure 
And God's word is full of promises to the believer that we rest on as we journey on this way. The hymn writer put it well, describing how the Christian views those times in his life that are so full of difficulty. He says, I've wrestled on towards heaven against storm and wind and tide and like a weary traveler that leaneth on his guide amid the shades of evening when sinks life's lingering sands, I hail the glory dawning in Emmanuel's land. Christian, we are on the narrow way. It is sometimes difficult. Sometimes we are pressed, we are afflicted. But God is our heavenly father. Jesus Christ is our savior. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and heaven is our home. Unsaved one, see all that you miss. See all that could be yours if you would come to Christ tonight and trust him. May God bless his word to our hearts. Could you take your hymn books with me, please? And if I can ask a favor, perhaps we will sing a verse of that hymn. I haven't planned this, and so I don't know the number off the top of my head. In Emmanuel's land. 595. Yes, thank you. 595. The sands of time are sinking. We'll sing. We'll sing verses 1, 4, and 6. Just those three verses. Standing to sing as we close the meeting this evening. Let me say... Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, if you would like to talk about spiritual things, I'd be delighted to try and help you. I know the elders here and Christian friends here would be the same. And if the Lord has been speaking to you tonight, if you realize that you must trust him and you must do it now, which is what God's word tells you, then it would be our privilege to help you this evening. 595, please, standing to sing. trust ourselves and every soul in this meeting to thee. We pray, Father, that you would graciously draw sinners to thyself. As Christ said, that it is only those whom the Father draws who may come to him. We pray, Lord, that you would give the gifts of faith and repentance this evening and enable poor sinners to get off the broad way and to stop their descent to hell by trusting in Jesus Christ, by coming in faith and resting in him, in whom alone is life eternal. 
And yet, Lord, we thank Thee that it is certain, that it is sure, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we pray that grace would be given tonight to do just that. We pray, Lord, that you would take us to our homes in safety, that you would enable us this week as we go back to work, whatever the circumstances may be, the challenges that face us, may there be opportunities to demonstrate our faithfulness to Christ, to demonstrate the power of God and the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Help us to be lights in a dark place. Strengthen thy people, we pray, Lord, and build thy church and do us good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.